Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hi, I'm Gabby. And I'm Gail, and we'll be your MCs. Thanks for joining us today online now, as you can see, for our Longing for Parenthood event. For those of you who are here because you're longing for parenthood, or for those who have family members or friends who are, we hope our time together today will be an encouragement to you. Uh, today, we have the privilege of hearing from Belinda Grant as our main speaker. Belinda is from Grace Christian Community Church, where her husband, Tim, is also a pastor there. We also have three other panelists with us today, Greg and Kamchi Cranin and Anne McKay. Um, give us a wave from the camera, you guys, so we can see um, who you are. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so first of all, um, they'll have a chance to introduce themselves, then Belinda will share a main message for us, um, and after this we'll have a time of Q&A with Belinda and our three panellists. As Belinda shares, if you have any questions you'd like to ask her or our panellists, please send them privately in the chat to the panellists, which will then be read out during the Q&A at the end. Right, before we get into things, um, Gail, would you like to pray for us, please? No worries. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of coming together today to hear and learn from Belinda, Greg and Kum Chi and Anne as they share their journey of longing for parenthood, how this has impacted their lives, choices they have made, and how you have equipped them in their circumstances. May we have a listening ear so that we may have understanding, perception and sensitivity. In Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, panellists. To Belinda. To Belinda. Over to you, Belinda. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, Belinda. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, thank you so much for having me join. I just, uh, before I start speaking, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself and explain a little bit about uh, my journey with infertility. Uh, so uh, I'm, as said previously, I'm married to Tim and he's a pastor here at Grace Christian Community Church where I meet, where I am at the moment. Um, and so uh, we, it took us uh, six years to, um, have our kids so we were married for two years then uh, we began to try having kids um, it took us uh, those six years uh, various different uh, medical interventions and procedures um, we had the heartbreak of two miscarriages over that time and then after six years um, and a very complicated and dangerous pregnancy um, I gave birth to twin boys and I've subsequently had two more kids uh, since then. Uh, so that's been our, um, our struggle, but it was a, uh, yeah, a really difficult time for us and a time where I did a lot of thinking about issues to do with infertility and how to view it as a Christian. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing a little bit of that um, a little bit later. So, yes. Um, so are we going to hear from the other panellists about their background or is that going to be during the Q&A? Yeah, no, so uh, maybe over to Greg and Kamchi, you guys can just introduce yourselves, please. Okay. I wear Greg and Kamchi. Uh, for those in cross-culture who know us from a long time, I haven't swapped my wife. She just dyed, it, <laughs> dyed her hair, okay? All right. But uh, yeah, just thanks for asking us on the panel. Uh, this is a, a topic that's very dear to our hearts. Uh, we've been married for 36 years. And at the 27-year mark when we were married, uh, that's when God gave us our little girl, Jessa May. Uh, she's adopted from Philippines. Uh, she was adopted at five years old and uh, she's currently 14. She's going to teenage years. So uh, and the, the whole adoption process actually took from start to finish uh, six and a half years for us. It's a huge journey. We can talk about that later. Uh, our own journey with longing for parenthood uh, began when we found out that we had unexplained infertility. And after going for tests and everything, they couldn't find anything wrong with us. So uh, we just kept going uh, and trying naturally and uh, nothing happened. 
Uh, we were advised to go to IVF on in 1996, uh, but um, yeah, we didn't. We just kept, kept trying naturally. And then what happened was we had lots of prayer, prayer ministry, and there was just no answer to prayer. So after studying and prayerfully grappling with the ethics of uh, assisted reproductive technology, uh, we decided to go on IVF with uh, a certain restrictions. So we began our first cycle in December 2004, and that began a two-year emotional roller coaster of up and downs. And uh, after 11 cycles, uh, without any success, it was clear the treatment wasn't working for us. And so we stopped IVF in September 2006. But God is all-powerful. Uh, he can perform miracles. And uh, uh, he didn't perform miracles in our case. And in, in, uh, when, when we prayed for a miracle, we had uh assumptions how god should answer that and expectations how he should answer our prayers uh he could have blessed us with a biological child but he didn't but he had a, a much better plan a bigger plan which we didn't weren't aware of at the time uh he is a loving and compassionate god you see six thousand kilometers away in philippines in a, a royal foundation in the orphanage in the philippines there was a little girl a little child who god heard her cries and longings for a special uh, mommy and daddy her own mommy and daddy and he answered that prayer yeah just allow me to introduce a daughter if you look at the collage there the top uh left hand corner uh, that's the first one of the first pictures we had of jessamay sleeping in the orphanage and the one photo be beneath that that's uh, mama pauline carrying her um she's the director of the orphanage um mama pauline is a missionary for um New Zealand. Her job is to match uh, committed Christian couples with uh, the kids at well. Every time Mama Pauline comes back from the adoption board, Jessamay would ask, have you found me a mommy and daddy yet? So when Mama, Mama Pauline chose us, the adoption board advised her to choose another younger couple because we were too old. And sensing that it was God's choice, um, Mama Pauline said, come on, let's give them a chance. We were 50 years old when the adoption was approved. When we first met Jessume, she called us mommy and daddy instantly. And to our surprise, so did all the other kids at well. We were told mm -hmm. that every time the adoptive parents come to pick up their child, all the kids would call them mommy and daddy as well. Uh, in fact, um, quite often they would say, when is it my turn? When we heard that, we actually understood why God chose us uh, to adopt uh, a child from the orphanage. All these kids are innocent and they didn't ask to be put in the orphanage. And there's a Bible verse, a promise in Psalms 27 verse 10, which says, my father and mother may abandon me, but the Lord will take care of me. We can see God's hand on Jessamay's life from birth to well and now to us. Uh, with Jessamay, we definitely felt a very strong sense of responsibility that God had entrusted her into our care. <coughs> And, and God knew that we would love her to bits. Uh, most kids would have hundreds of photos taken of them before the age of five. And with Jessamay, we only had a few photos which we managed to salvage from her carers because many were lost uh, with the computer breakdown. Um, and after settling down with us, we gave her a, a special gift, which is a, a photo shoot with a professional photographer. And these are some of the photos uh, taken, uh, the middle three are taken by the photographer. Mm. Yeah, just to finish off very quickly, we would just leave you with a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, just because God loves us doesn't mean that he will always give us what we ask. He didn't do that with his own son. He won't do that with us either. In Gethsemane, the holiest of all petitioners prayed three times that a certain cup might pass from him, and it did not. God answers our prayers as he wills, not as we want. He is the father and we are his children. God may not always answer as we wish, but thankfully his answers are always wiser than our requests. And we found that out. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess it's my turn now. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Anne. Hi. Look, I'm Anne and um, I've never married, never experienced pregnancy, childbirth or raising young children, very young children. There's probably a different aspect to, to, um, to the grief of childlessness in my case. I'm the fifth of six girls in my family and all my sisters are married with children and grandchildren. You know, some people have said to me, oh, you must have the gift of singleness. And I'd be thinking, it's a gift I don't want. 
Um, but I think I have been given the ability to love other people's children. And I guess there's a difficulty in that I've been endowed with the same hormones and feelings as other women. And we're made for the relationship and our bodies are geared up for having children. So I've needed to grieve, not only about not sharing a special relationship of mutual love and respect, but also about not having children. And um, it's interesting, um, Greg, and, Greg and Kumji, you know, that you got this orphan because when I was young, if people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I'd often say I want to work in an orphanage. And I struggled physically with a chronic back problem. So, you know, I felt that um, maybe this romanticised orphanage idea was probably out of my realm, really. But I did become very interested in helping kids with special needs and had quite a bit to do with a young girl who lived near us when I was finishing off secondary school and uni. And she stayed with us quite a bit too. And because and because of heart problems, she wasn't allowed to go to school. And she actually died at the age of six. And it had a big impact on me. And I was involved in um, special education for a long time, um, probably due to, due to little Pammy. And I had thought about foster care or actually respite care. And in my mind was a weekend a month, maybe with a couple of primary school age kids. And investigating this was a bit delayed because um, I lived in very small places that were unsuitable and I was also trying to manage my back problem. But when wonderfully I moved into a larger space and was in between housemates, I got in touch with Berry Street, an agency, and the process began. But then I was quite flabbergasted when I got a call asking me to take on a 16-year-old girl full-time. A bit different from weekend respite. But I did know that Berry Street had been very meticulous in their investigation of me, and I knew that the last thing anyone wanted for the, was for the placement to fail. Um, so I said yes, and Jackie moved in. Thank God he is wise where we are not. And there was just so much navigation, you know, while we both adjusted. Because 16, you know, she knows what she wants. But Jackie stayed for five years and we're still in contact now 20 years later, which is really lovely. Um, more recently, my life has been hugely impacted, in fact, turned right upside down by a young Aboriginal girl you would have seen on a photo um, that where there was a photo of Belinda, yeah, there's Serona. And Serona is now 14 years old and she's been with me going on um, three years now. It's a long story of how she came to be in my care, but I didn't in her case go out seeking like I had with Berry Street and, and you know, um, got Jackie. Serona just sort of, um, I suppose God just put her in my life and, and things just snowballed. <laughs> Anyway, um, the one big thing I think was just for me was just being open to what God wanted and, you know, God, God does, um, he's very creative and I think that sometimes the path that we see should be the only path um, is, is in fact not and, and, I mean, Serona's taught me so much and it's been a, a very um, gruelling journey actually. Uh, but she's God's gift to me and she's just beautiful now, but it's just, you know, it, it's not, it's a parenthood I don't think is ever easy and, um, and being single too, it's, uh, it has added challenges, but I'm just so grateful for, I guess, a community around me that really gives support and some of the, you know, I've got BACA, which is the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency and, and child protection and a few other, you know, um, places where I can go to for help. But um, anyway, I've been, I'm looking after an orphan, even though she has got um, parents, but to all intents and purposes, she is. And I feel very privileged. So that's me. Thanks so much, uh, Anne and Greg and Kumchi. Uh, so we'll hand it over to you, Belinda, now. We're very excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, about a year and a half after Tim and I started uh, trying to have a kid, um, our GP gave us a referral for a public fertility clinic at a hospital in Sydney. 
After a few months wait, the day arrived. We were nervous, but ready to see what was the next step medically in our attempts to have a child. The doctor was fairly old and quite old fashioned. He took our history and then said, well, we should get you started on IVF. Now we were a little bit shocked. Uh, we hadn't even had time to think that through. Uh, the GP had said uh, that he would likely do some tests and then maybe start us on some ovulation medication. So he put on the brakes and said, well, we're Christians. So uh, even if we were at the point of considering IVF, we'd want to know more about it from an ethical standpoint. The doctor paused, looked us in the eye and said, well, that's well and good, but I want you to know something. You will never know real love until you're a grandparent. Then he pointed to my husband and said, when you're an old man and you're at a barbecue and someone introduces you to their grandchildren and asks you where yours are, you're going to want to know that you've done everything possible and don't have any regrets. Now, there was so much wrong with what he said. It was emotionally manipulative, insensitive and unhelpful in so many letters, levels. I, I was nearly brought to tears. But I mentioned this horrible conversation because I think it really highlights to me the world's view of childlessness. It's a personal need that needs to be fulfilled. Morality shouldn't play a role because it's so important. And it's a hole that must be filled no matter the cost. And when the world is presenting this reality to you every day, it's not surprising that so many Christians like us feel like that too. Today, we're gonna to be talking about longing for children from a Christian point of view, which as you might expect, is different from the view I've just described. My prayer is that we'll be able to think hard about how the Bible views these issues so that we can not only deal with the heartache, the pain and the decisions in a Christian way, but that we could also find comfort and hope from our Heavenly Father. Uh, so I'm going to start by looking at uh, how we see childlessness through the story of the Bible. We'll talk about God's view of childlessness and how to be godly if this is your situation in life. And finally, we'll finish with a few suggestions of how um, churches and Christians can care better for those who are longing for children. Um, and I'm going to pray to God that he'll help us to navigate this difficult topic well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it shows us how to be godly and comforts us in our time of need. Uh, please help uh, my words to be encouraging to people listening and help us to do a good job honouring you and uh, either living with childlessness or supporting those who are dealing with it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, when I was dealing with the pain of infertility, I turned to the Bible to see what it had to say about my struggles. Did God understand? Did he care? And how did he want me to navigate it? And I found so many stories of infertility in the Bible, of grief, of disappointment, and also extraordinarily answered prayers. But how was I supposed to think about them? How should I relate to Sarah or Hannah or Rachel's stories? Were we the same? Were we different? Would God answer my prayers the way he answered theirs? And how did Jesus make a difference? Because when it comes to issues in the Bible, it's important that we look at the stories and the commands in the context of how they fit into the Bible story. So we could work out what it means for the people who lived in the time and what it means for us on this side of the cross. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the topic of childlessness and infertility through the whole Bible to see how we can view it in the here and now. So the Bible starts with creation. Adam and Eve are created and God gives them a command to be fruitful and to multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. 
ruling the earth, being fruitful and multiply. Adam and Eve are encouraged to have kids. Children are good. And they're also a necess- they were also a necessary part of God's plan for humanity. But then sin enters the world. Having children becomes painful as Eve is cursed. And when their son Cain kills Abel, we see the first ever heartbreaking loss of a child. Parenthood is no longer a purely good and perfect thing. Sin mars it. But through it all, there's hope. God continues to show love to sinful people. Eve conceives again and calls the boy Seth, which means replacement. And it's into Seth's line which God's promises begin to take shape. Then in Genesis 12, we meet Abraham. What an unlikely recipient for God's plans and promises. He has no children. And he and his wife are old. But God makes extraordinary promises that not only will he have a child in his old age, but through that child, God is going to make a great nation and more descendants than the stars in the sky. And through Abraham's children, the whole world will be blessed. And so children become a big part of God's plan for his people. God promises his people an inheritance and a future blessing for the whole world. But having children is a big part of this. You get your allotted inheritance in the promised land from your parents and you pass it on to your children. And though you might not get to see God's promises being fulfilled, your children's children might. And so infertility in the Old Testament was extra heartbreaking because your kids were part of the way you received the blessing of God. And not only that, in Israel, fertility was wrapped up with obedience of the nation. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 25 to 26, it says, Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in the land. I will give you a full lifespan. So in the Old Testament, we have these two facts, infertility being linked to Israel's disobedience and fertility being linked to sharing the blessings and promises of God. To help us get our heads around this and what it was like in Israel, I think a story of the Bible where we see this really clearly is the story of Naomi in the book of Ruth. Naomi and her husband and her two sons moved to Moab during the famine when Israel's disobedience had led to the land being cursed and everything goes wrong. Her husband husband dies. Her sons marry Moabite women, but in a decade they are in Moab. No grandchildren are born. Then her sons die. So here's Naomi away from God's land with no sons or husband to care for her and no children to carry on her husband's name or to claim his inheritance in the promised land. So when Ruth offers to go home with Naomi, she says, what's the point? I can't produce another husband to give you. My share in God's inheritance is over. Infertility and death have robbed Naomi of everything. But when Ruth marries Boaz, a relative of Naomi's husband, Naomi's hope and future is returned. She holds that longed-for grandchild in her arms, a replacement for the ones she's lost. And we learn that not only does Naomi get a share in the inheritance of Israel through this boy, but she has a special role in the promises because the child in her arms ends up being King David's grandfather. I think this is why there's such a focus on infertility and childlessness in the Old Testament, because your role in God's plan is tied up with having kids. Childlessness is impossibly hard at the best of times, but for the Israelites, it was that extra tragedy of missing out on being part of God's great plans. When I was really struggling emotionally with the pain of infertility and I looked through the Old Testament, 
could see the stark reality of my pain reflected back at me. Hannah crying so dramatically in the temple, not the temple, at the tabernacle, that Eli the priest thinks she's drunk. In Proverbs 30, verse 16, it compares the need for children of the childless womb to the ground longing for water or a fire that's never quenched. And one of the verses that really spoke to me about my experience with infertility was found in Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. And for those who are trying to have kids, that concept of hope deferred is so poignant. The up and down roller coaster of cycles and treatment, hope and despair round and round until you think you can't bear it anymore. Praying that this will be the month, but knowing it might never happen. So going back to our Bible story, with Israel still sinning and infertility a continuing part of life, Israel starts to hope for something more. God's promised Messiah, a new peaceful kingdom ruled by God's true king, real blessing. And God makes an extraordinary promise at that time in Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren one who did not bear Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labour. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. God promises hope and a family to those who are barren. What can that mean? How is that possible? And so we have this building expectation of a time where infertility and childlessness will be different. And then Jesus arrives. And how does he change things? And for us particularly, how are our circumstances different than the people in the Old Testament? Well, Jesus brings a new covenant and a new inheritance. Instead of a land that you have for a while and pass on to your children, Jesus offers a forever home with him, perfect without sin. And there's no waiting for it, no hoping for children who might carry on your name, give you a significance and a future. Your future and significance are in Christ. And no longer are people living in this blessed for obedience, cursed for disobedience model of the Old Testament. Jesus was cursed for our disobedience on the cross and his godliness and blessing are ours. And finally, we have a new command. Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and multiply. We're told to go and make disciples of all nations. And we don't actually need children to do that. We can grow God's kingdom. We can see people join God's family in so many new ways. We can have spiritual children and love people and have families that no longer need to come from our own body. And I think that's one of the reasons we see such a positive view of singleness in the New Testament. Paul celebrates living in that state, encouraging singleness because of all the things that are possible when you're unattached. Because life is no longer about creating a lineage. It's about the good news of eternal life for the world. Looking at this reality, viewing my struggles through what Christ had done, was so helpful. It didn't subtly mean that infertility was easy, and it definitely didn't mean that the pain was gone. We live in this difficult in-between time where pain and sin and disappointment still exist, where we groan as we wait. But there was so much to hope for so much value in my life, irrespective of whether I could have children. I had a hope and a future and a saviour and a father that Hannah and Sarah and Naomi could only have dreamed of. And so, in light of this, in light of where we sit in the Bible, I want to say five truths for those who are longing to have children. Number one, 
infertility is not a punishment or a curse for disobedience. That if you're only good enough, then God will answer your prayers. That isn't the way the new covenant works. If you're feeling overwhelmed by sin or worry that God is punishing you for them or that you don't deserve your struggles, please know that your sins are paid for completely and you are God's beloved child, completely forgiven. There's not a hierarchy of those who have kids are better people and those who don't aren't, not at all. Uh, we're all forgiven. We're all loved for God, loved by God. Number two, there's no guarantee in this life that God will give children to those who want them. It doesn't mean that we don't pray and hope the God who gave a woman in her 90s a baby is the same God that we serve now. Miracles happen all the time and God is generous and kind to those without. But it won't happen to everyone. There's no New Testament promise of fertility for all. Never think that there's something specifically wrong with you or that you don't have enough faith and that's why you're not having a child. Number three, your hope and your inheritance in the promise of God is not dependent on having a child. And your role in God's kingdom isn't diminished because you're not able to be fruitful and multiply. In our society, which ironically doesn't value parenthood as much as the Bible anyway, there can still be this concept that you're not a real woman if you're not a mum, or you're not a family if you don't have children. But that's not Christian. Our value, our identity, who we are is secure in Christ and nowhere else. And in our world and in our churches, as we've already heard today, there are so many children, so many people who need love, that need Christ. I want you to just pause for a minute and think about the people in your life who've played a significant role in your Christian faith who aren't your parents. I'm sure we can all think of those people who offered love where we needed it, who showed us Jesus. Whether you have kids or not, you can play a crucial role in the lives of others. Number four, God has a special love for those without children. Something we see in the Bible over and over again is that our God is the God of the have-nots. The poor, the widow and the childless, God has a particular concern and love for them. God isn't emotionally disinvested in our struggles. He genuinely cares and is on your side. When I was crying out to God for children, I'd start to think, if God loves me, he would answer my prayer. What if he doesn't? So verses that reminded me of his unconditional love were so important. All the different things that couldn't separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus from Romans 8. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite the pain and disappointment, God's love for me was bigger than I could possibly imagine and was demonstrated on the cross. And I could trust in that despite my pain. But he's also not afraid of our pain. We look at the Psalms and we see pain and hurt and so many, why, 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 God, why? And those questions come up so much with childlessness. And rather than trying to be strong or being embarrassed by our doubts and our fears, God can handle our pain and our grief and our questions. His love for us is strong enough to take it. And finally, number five, beware the temptation to compromise. There are ways of having children, both as a couple and a single person, that are not appropriate for Christians. And you need to do the work to think through what is the godly thing to do in your set of circumstances. 
Personally, from my own thinking and research, um, I believe that IVF is something that Christians can in good conscience do. That just like we don't blink about getting treatment when we have cancer or taking insulin when we have diabetes, it's okay for doctors and medicine to be involved in the concept, in the process of conception too, if it isn't happening naturally. Now, not all Christians will agree with me and you need to make your own call. But within the fertility industry, there are so many minefields in terms of ethics. Egg and sperm donations, surrogacy, excessive frozen embryos, genetic testing. And generally those who are working in the industry care about people getting pregnant and not the life of any embryos created or even the ethical framework of those they're caring for. So it's important that you've done the work to know exactly what you feel is acceptable before you go in, because you actually might have to fight to do the godly thing. Now, I recommend reading something like this. Uh, this book is called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made uh, by Dr. Megan Best. Um, and it goes into uh, quite a lot of depth about the start of life from both a medical, a biblical and an ethical point of view. Now, uh, these decisions are so hard. And when you want something badly, it's tempting to do whatever you can to make it happen, to not even want to think about the details. And there are also temptations for single people, particularly um, from my friends I've noticed, as women, when your age goes up and your friends start having kids, it can be tempting to compromise. Marry someone who isn't a Christian because you don't want to miss the window of having kids. And I've seen this many, many times. And these aren't easy situations and I don't want to downplay how hard it is, especially when it feels like these things are so much harder for you than they are for other people. But in both those difficult circumstances, God's way is right and good and best. And part of being a Christian is having faith not just faith that God can save us, but faith that his way is best and that no otherwise good outcome is worth the cost of sin. Children aren't our God, our Heavenly Father is, and parenthood isn't our Saviour, Jesus Christ is. We need to trust in our Father that a life lived following him, even if it involves childlessness, is still the best life. And there might be some of you who've made really hard choices to do what you believe is right and good that have reduced your chances of having kids. God knows your sacrifice and your pain. He sees and he cares and he loves you. Now, finally, I want to have a talk about how, as a church, we can love well those who are longing to have kids. The first thing is listen. Proverbs 13 verse 18 says, to answer without listening, this is folly and shame. And listening is so important as we care for those who are longing for children. The first and best thing you can do for your friends or family is to hear their pain and experience and find out from them what's the best way to help and encourage them. Each person's experience of childlessness is different and everyone's needs are different. So personally, when I was struggling with infertility, other people's kids became really important to me. It was comforting to know that my life didn't have to be devoid of kids just because at the time I hadn't been able to have any of my own. But I have other friends who just had to take a time and just avoid kids because at that stage, it was just too much of a painful reminder of their struggle. So the most important thing to do is listen, work out what's helpful for your friends and what they need. And don't downplay struggles or say things like, your time will come or God has a plan. I have a friend who hasn't been able to have kids and so many people have said to her, oh, well, it's probably a good thing. Think of all the fun things you and your husband can do or, oh, you're lucky, kids are so difficult to look after. 
And of course, this doesn't help, didn't help her, not at all. It just made things worse. We need to mourn with those who mourn and support people in the way that they will find the most helpful. And be aware of particular times that can be extra painful. Baby showers, birth announcements, Christmas and Mother's Day were some hard times for me. And it can be helpful to keep that in mind and check in on your friends when you, you know that they might need some extra help and space. And uh, the next thing is to share your life and your kids. Um, and now with the caveat that I've already mentioned that not everybody with our kids will want this, it's wonderful if you're someone with kids to think hard about how you can include your kids in the lives of your childless friends. Uh, Tim and I have some friends who have a single girl who is they see as a member of their family. They've always made sure that they've got a spare room in their house so she can visit whenever she wants to. And they've told her they'll never take a job or move away unless that decision works for her. I know other friends who bring their single friends on holidays. And we've always made an effort to invite um, our single friends to our kids' birthday parties because we want them to know that they're an important part of our kids' lives. Sometimes when you have kids, you can think of yourselves as the boring one that single people and childless couples won't want to hang out with. But my experience at church is that those without kids at my church love the chance to spend everyday time with my kids. Having dinner, joining in for prayers and Bible readings and bedtimes. It's lovely for our kids and it's lovely for our friends. And social isolation was something I found really hard when I was struggling to have kids. My friends who had kids before me would often hang out without me. It was terrible feeling like I was being left behind and excluded, even when I knew it wasn't deliberate. Again, don't just assume. Ask and see how you can include all people in your social events and in your family. And finally, provide a care for those who don't have kids to provide for them. My husband has a great auntie and uncle who are in their 90s and weren't able to have kids. But their Christian nieces, one of which is my mother-in-law, and their church do a wonderful job caring for them. They have company, they have assistance, they have more love, support and care than many of their peers who already have kids to look after them. What a testament to the gospel. Let's be a real family to our Christian family in need. Back to that terrible doctor's office. When that ins insensitive man told Tim and I we would never know real love until we had grandchildren, we were hurt and angry. But as we left the clinic, the thing that really stood out to us was that the doctor we met was the one who didn't know real love. Yes, he had grandchildren and I'm sure that was a beautiful thing, but he didn't know Christ. He didn't have a hope and a future beyond this life. But friends, we know love. And in the up and down cycle of hope and disappointment, in the grief of dreams of parenthood slipping away, it's that love that will sustain us. Our Father loves us and he knows us. And one day when our Saviour returns, we will meet him face to face. He will wipe every tear from our eye and our hope will finally be realised. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your love, for the way that you meet us in our pain and in our sin. Please comfort those who are waiting or grieving. Help those of us with kids to love those without well. And help us all, with kids or without, to keep our eyes on heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Awesome. Thanks so much uh, for your message, Belinda. Um, that was really great and helpful, insightful. Uh, so now we'll um, ask some questions um, to all the panelists and um, whoever wants to jump in can just jump in and answer them. Uh, so would you like to read the first question? Okay. How would you start a conversation with someone who is struggling with childness? That's childlessness. Sorry. How would you start a conversation with someone who is struggling with childlessness? All the panel. <laughs> um, look, I think it's it's a tricky it's tricky to know how to broach it because sometimes you don't know where people are at or what's happening. Um, yeah, so it is. It's a really, really tricky thing. Um, uh, I find um, you don't start with when are you going to have kids or any of those questions. But generally, I don't ask that ask that question. I tend to ask, so um, where are you guys at with um, kids? Is that something that you're hoping for or trying for? And just try to be sensitive and, and leave the door open for people to be able to talk or not talk, depending on how they're feeling. Yeah, I think, Belinda, what you said before about listening is really important. And I think, um, I think it's walking alongside people. It's only as you develop a relationship that they might feel comfortable to actually speak with you about their struggles because it is such a very personal thing. But I think just being with people and really, um, yeah, listening. Mm -hmm. Have your eyes wide open and your ears wide open to just hear where they might want to go. Yeah, I find that it depends on the connection and the relationship we have with the person. And then uh, quite often we let them uh, share first and then let them direct the conversation. And then sometimes you can just ask them how you can how we can best support them. And quite a lot of times because we are open with our uh, problems with infertility and adoption, people know us, our background, so they will come to us directly or sometimes they get referral from people who come to us and talk specifically about IVF or adoption. Hmm. Great, thanks. Um, our next question is, should the default position for Christian married couples be to long for parenthood? What if neither husband or wife feel the desire to be a parent? Yeah, look, it's it's a really tricky thing, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think when it comes to having kids, I, I tend to really want to, I don't, I don't want to just say, God says kids are good, so therefore everyone should try to have kids. Um, I think it's really important that we, we see where that, um, what's our reasoning behind it? Because I think uh, sometimes, you know, our love of freedom or um, wanting to be able to live our, you know, live the way we want to can sometimes be a factor um, that can make us decide not to have kids. And so I think it's it's a big deal to look at something that God says is a blessing and say no to it. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's wrong not to have kids. I just think it's something to pray hard about and to look at your own heart. And I do know I have some friends who um, the wife, you know, was quite happy not to have kids. She wasn't particularly maternal. Um, she was working in ministry. Um, but she looked at the Bible and she went, well, you know, even if this is, not something that I, you know, am really passionate about. I think having kids is good and I'm going to have them. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky one. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, I think as you said before, the, you know, 
you can have a fulfilling life without having children, et cetera. But it is important for if somebody's deciding to do that, just like anything, to explore what's happening underneath as well. Uh, what are the reasons why they're doing that? Uh, you know, extreme examples, are there things from family of origin that might be influencing that, that might need counselling, et cetera? That's fine. But there's nothing wrong. If they've decided not to have children, that's fine, you know, that's fine. But I think it's always good to look underneath and to explore, explore that. Uh, you just don't know whether they're, are they making those decisions uh, for healthy, for in, in the shalom, in the, in the healthy reasons, or are they making those decisions from, uh, from other areas? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, next question. At what point should someone lay down their desire to have kids rather than seek alternative measures and accept that it isn't God's plan for them to have kids of their own? <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does anyone else want to add to that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think it is a really hard one. Um, one of the things when we, uh, so my husband was studying at Bible College when we were first looking at having kids. And uh, so we actually caught up with our ethics lecturer, which was a bonus having someone to talk to about uh, what we thought was appropriate. And one of the big things that he said was um, the infertility industry kind of, it sounds terrible they prey on your hope and there's this kind of um, thing that can happen where you just, well, just one more, just one more, just keep trying, just keep trying and it can take over your life. Um, it can be de detrimental to your marriage. Um, and so I think it's really good, I think, to, to kind of have a stopping point in mind. Um, so we had kind of a certain number of, times that we were going to try we had kind of what would be the things that we would do if it didn't work out in this amount of time or this amount of treatment um, and I think that's a really healthy thing because um, yeah it can overtake your life I think it can become a bit of an obsession and uh, yeah I, I just think it's good to it, it's good to have a plan of what you're going to do if it's not going to happen uh, yeah, I think that's a helpful thing. Yeah. I think, uh, like, I've been really helped, like, from Philippians in the Bible where Paul says, I have learned to be content. And that word learned um, sort of indicates a lot of effort and time. And so, yes, you can learn, learn to be content, but it is a process. And I know, particularly probably when I turned 40, um, and this came upon me as a bit of a surprise, but I was having lunch with one of my sisters in, up in the food court. And um, for some, some reason, I expressed out aloud um, how painful it was in many ways to have not had kids and realised that actually it probably wasn't going to happen. Well, being realistic, it wasn't going to happen. And because I'd never actually expressed it openly before, I suddenly found I had tears just pouring down my cheeks in the middle of this food court. And it was... Um, yeah, it was quite interesting. And I think it, it was a relief that the unspoken thoughts I perhaps hadn't processed consciously were out there. Um, and I think maybe one of the good things about the COVID times is that there has been a lot of grief around, just loss of control and, and what we can and can't do and everything. And the acknowledgement that it's okay to grieve and grieve healthily. Um, life isn't always what we expect and... And even if we don't have the expectations, society does and we are part of society. And, yeah, it is like I guess that was that was sort of a, a bit of a turning point for me, although it was a, a bit of a subconscious thing initially, I think, um, because I've worked in special education and, um, you know, there there is that fact of the older you are as a mum, the more likely of, you know, having um, children with special needs. And um, Serona has special needs herself, actually. Uh, yeah, so it, so it's it is it is a tricky one. That I think, yeah, just sorting it out with God, and the process of learning to be content. 
I find that sometimes when people are stuck in wanting their own biological child, they actually close off the other options of adoption and, and uh, fostering. So usually I gently remind them that, you know, if you ask, or you pray for a, a, a child, let God be God and let him decide how he's going to bless you with, the, with one. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if they're stuck in that emotional state, counseling helps. And I've seen that that helped too, yeah. Mm. Now, I think in everything there is, there is this getting to a point of surrendering, isn't it? Uh, it's as part of, uh, it's hard, but it's, it's, it's surrendering things to God. You, you get to a point where you, you are surrendering. It's not just in, in childlessness, it's, it's everything. Um, and surrendering to God, the outcomes uh, of your prayers. And so it's a hard state to be in. You come out of it every so often, you come in, but it's really, that's part of our discipleship, isn't it? Um, it's not easy, but it's surrendering things over to God. Uh, and releasing it to him and let him answer. Yeah. God, God doesn't make mistakes. Yeah. And he is good. And I think it's clinging on to those sort of things, mm -hmm. um, which affect every area of life, as you say. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> and I think sometimes, um, yeah, just channeling the energy and creativity into other areas, is um is has helped me a lot. Yeah. And I think you you look at people like Johnny Erickson Tata, who was you know made a quadriplegic at 17. Well, she couldn't use her artistic skills the way she used to, but now she paints with a paintbrush in her mouth, kind of thing. And I think it's the same with adoption and fostering and stuff. It's keeping your eyes for that wider perspective, not just that narrow thing you need to have your own. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, can I that's a great point, Anne. Can I just pick up on that? What what uh, we actually did was we set up a we went you know through all the pain and and etc. This is before we had a, a, a adoption. We actually set up a, a and said, well, well, will this be wasted? This experience and all the pain will it be wasted? No. What we can do is you know the whole theme throughout the Bible. Uh, we are blessed to be a blessing. So can we actually even use this pain and our experience to help other people? So we set up a support group. Um, but also I think the question in anything that we need to be asking is how can we, how can we surrender to God to use this circumstance so the Christ is formed in us? You know, uh, it, it's not only the good things, it's also the, the, the hard things in our life and go, or well, how, let's not waste this experience, this, 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 this loss, this grief, whatever it is, but how, how can we surrender to God and allow God to, to form Christ in us? It's a hard thing to do, but it's it's when you do that, I, it, it's never a loss. It's never a wasted time. It's never a wasted experience because you're helping other people, but also uh, through that uh, Christ is being formed in us and we're, we're, we're becoming more like Christ through this suffering, through this pain. Yeah, it's a, that's a great point, man. Thank you. Oh, and your crying is painful. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks, guys. Some really good, thought-provoking um, answers. Um, uh, what are so? Uh, third question: What are some of the ethical and financial considerations of IVF, and what are some of the practical and financial considerations of foster care or adoption? Um, in terms of um, practical things to do with. IVF, I think the big, I mean, I talked about it a little bit in my talk, but I think the big issue that needs to be thought about in terms of IVF is um, embryos. So, um, you know, we, as Christians, we believe that uh, life begins at conception. And so, um, yeah, those, those little tiny, you know, a couple of celled, things which the world says is just cells um, we believe that's a human life and so we need to treat those cells the, we need to see those cells the way that God does um, and so that is so there's all kinds of things that you need to think about to do with that um, one of the big ones is the number of uh, embryos that are produced 
So uh, a fertility doctor will always want as many embryos as possible because the more embryos you have, the more likely you are to get pregnant. Uh, but what can end up happening is that you can have the number of kids you want and then have a whole lot of embryos left over. And what do you do with that? Uh, and all over the world, um, and, and also through the very uh, process of IVF coming to be, um, millions of lives have been lost through the discarding of embryos. And so as Christians, we need to think really hard about how we navigate that and um, what we feel is appropriate. Um, and so I always talk to people who are considering IVF to think about, you know, to make a decision beforehand about how many um, eggs you want to fertilise and how you want to deal with that and whether you freeze eggs so that rather than fertilising them all or what you do, but it's really important to think those things through. Um, and it's very costly fertility treatment. There are public systems, but it still costs a lot of money. And so that's, that's a wisdom decision that you have to make. Um, as well to be wise it's it, it's it's okay to spend money to to try to have kids but um, it's also important to think about the cost and to try to be really wise with that um, oh, another little thing I wanted to add is um, there's all these little things that get suggested in infertility treatment that you don't even think about so a big one is genetic testing so now they can actually genetically test embryos before they implant them. And what they don't say to you is that they, they, they're not intending to implant the ones that have any genetic dysfunction. But if we believe that those embryos are, you know, real lives and children, well, then we're going to implant them all because we think they should have a chance. Um, so those are just some, some issues I think that can come up. I think from the fostering side of things, I mean, I have agencies involved who are supported financially, but actually there's an enormous cost emotionally because these children are not your own and you don't, I, I mean, I think now from the, it's the end of last year um, that Serona will probably be with me until she's 18, but actually last year particularly was a very tentative year with five court hearings, um, while exploration was done with her biological mother, her biological father and, and various family members. It's particularly complex because she's Aboriginal. And so although she's, uh, you know, we've developed a relationship, it's been a very, very difficult time. And, um, and the cost to me has been quite incredible. And um, so I've had to reach out for help and say, I need respite because I can't do this long term. And I think with fostering too, there's always that thing, this child has come from a, another, another, she's, she belongs to another family actually. And she's, Serona still very much belongs to her Aboriginal family. Um, and so that's, and even, even with Jackie, you know, it's integrating this child with her background, um, you know, into a new situation. And it's, so it's, it's quite a complex thing when you, you have this, this young person, you're trying to show love and, and, you know, share a situation, share your family with, share your love with, who actually has this whole other aspect that just is still there and is important to embrace. And you can't just, you know, wipe that out. It actually has to be um, sought after. When I was doing some training with Berry Street before I got Jackie, they were very clear that the biological parents might really resent me and it might be very difficult. Now, it's been good that um, mostly um, the family members of both Jackie and Serona have just been relieved that I've taken, taken over the responsibility but sometimes I just feel like all I'm doing is the responsibility part, not the fun part. <laughs> so, um, but that's, you know, that's just because it has been quite wearing. Um, but, yeah, the fostering, you know, you, you watch these programs, I guess, on television where people foster 10,000 children and 
and I'm sitting there with one thinking, oh, my goodness, how do they do, how do, they do it? I can't even cope with one. Um, but I think practically you just you do need to get that community support around you and don't be afraid to ask for any help that you need. Um, yeah. That'll do. <laughs> yeah. In fact, international adoption is very attractive because you don't have to deal with your biological parents, which is why a lot of people uh, opt for international um, adoption, yeah. And I think it costs about maybe about $20,000 all in all uh, for international adoption. And with IVF, when we did it, it was about after Medicare rebate, about $1,000 per cycle. So it depends on how many cycles you have. That's why I'm busking at the moment in Australia. In <laughs> <laughs> but international adoption under Australian conditions is there must be uh, either a signatory or abide by the Hague Convention. So they have all the ethics within that. So other countries, not so much, but the, the Australian system is long and arduous, but it's, it's, it's good. It actually has checks and balances. So I'm just reading off, you know, the core belief of the Hague Convention is the birth family or the extended family should raise a child. When that's not possible, then it's, you know, uh, that they adopt the child out overseas. There's also prevention of abduction, sale or trafficking of children. So there's checks and balances within that. And in Australia, that's the only way you can adopt through that. So that's a good system. However, in Australia, the bureaucracy is huge. <laughs> that's why it took us six, six and a half years. Other countries might be two or something, but the system is good. The, the, the checks and balances are very good. Um, so in terms of the ethics of that, uh, they make sure like for, for Jessime, they actually even uh, put uh, notices in the paper and trying to find the biological parents, et cetera, et cetera. So they did all those things beforehand. And then finally uh, they said, well, that's it, we've given her a chance, and now she's up for adoption for, uh, for inter-country adoption. So they do all those things, and Australia is very particular, Philippines is very particular mm. too. So, so I think that answers the questions, I think, anything? Thank you. Okay, next question. How do we celebrate God's gift of children to us while being sensitive to those who don't have children or grandchildren? How can we do this, particularly in our use of social media? It's really hard. It's, um, yeah, yeah, I think it was tricky because, like, yeah, so when uh, basically when we started trying to have kids, was around the time when Facebook came into being. And so we had the fun of, you know, the, the world of people putting their ultrasounds on screens and people putting their kids up and friends who started trying at the same time as us watching their kids grow up. And, and look, to be honest, there's still moments where I've got a few friends who had, who got pregnant around the same time that I had my miscarriage. And sometimes when they put up their photos of their kids, that are at the age of the child that I miscarried, I, 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 it, it still hurts, even with my own kids, you know, with, with my, um, you know, the kids that I have now. And so, yeah, it's really hard. I think it's, it's, it's just worth, I think, being sensitive. Um, uh, I was part of a group of friends who we were struggling with infertility together. And the big thing that really upset us was when people would complain about their kids on social media so the classic one was oh my kid's broken this thing anyone want a kid or like oh you know for sale to a good home like those kind of things were just uh, just horrifically heartbreaking when you're going through infertility when all you want is a child and other people just don't seem to appreciate it so I'm conscious of that I'm conscious of being thankful but not boastful about my kids um, I try not to, I, I do put a little bit of photos of my kids on social media, but I try not to do it too much. Um, but I think the main thing is, and I think this is true of social media, regardless of infertility, is we don't, you don't post things to look good or without thinking about how other people might be affected. And so I think if you're mindful and know that you might sometimes hurt your friends, but you know, you never try to, I guess. Yeah, just 
a little bit with that is yes, be sensitive, but I, I don't think we should be walking around on eggshells. I think it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to celebrate. Uh, and if uh, this doesn't, I'm a pastor, but uh, <laughs> doesn't, this doesn't sound unpastoral, in pastoral, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, people have to, that's part, we have to teach people as part of life. There's, there's suffering in part of life. And, that, and, you know, we're not, we shouldn't be walking around on eggshells all the time. And have, we should have support groups and, and all that type of thing. But, man, there's, there's a lot of terrible things that happen in the world. It's part of the fallen world, isn't it? And we don't want to. We will need to build resilience and, and and into people rather than you know have these little people who are all soft and whatever. So that sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? But anyway, <laughs> but you know, Maha, uh, yeah, we, we need to be careful not to not to put you know wrap people in little bubble wraps and everything. This is this is part of life and it's reality. And the gospel speaks to that. Yeah. And I think the other thing about it is listening. Like again, it just keeps coming back to listening to. To if your friends say, look, I find it a bit hard when you do this, well, then you maybe listen and you don't do it. Um, but I know a lot of my childless friends really love seeing pictures of my kids and love, you know, they're the ones who put the little hearts on all my photos mm. and comments because my kids are a really important part of their life. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky balancing act, but I think we want to do our best to love people, um, yeah, and be mindful of, yeah, celebrating the good gift that God has given, but also mourning with those who mourn. I don't really do Facebook particularly. I'm sort of on there just to keep in touch with, you know, a few people. But I know I've been reluctant to change my, my um, you know, profile picture which hasn't been changed for 12 years, so I look really young and slim and everything. <laughs> but um, one of the reluctance has been, yeah, part of the reluctance has been that, um, you know, I'd love a photo shot of me with Serona at the moment because that's part of my life. But I'm very aware that there is one particular family member who might find that very difficult. And Serona's just loving Facebook because she's discovered all these relatives, you know, up north and all this. And so it's been wonderful for her. And so it's great that she can post, you know, stuff. Um, and, yeah, so that that's really good. But I, I just still will step back because I don't want to um, get into damage control with, you know, a few of her relatives who I really respect. Um. Thanks, they were very good, very good answers. <laughs> um, so next question, how can individuals and the church uh, lovingly care for parents who have suffered through a miscarriage? I, uh, again, like it, a lot of it is about the listening and getting a sense of what other people want. Um, but I know for me, when I had my miscarriage, one of the one of the really tricky things is that the world doesn't see like the world sees that as a sad loss of pregnancy, but they don't see it as the death of a child. But it is, and I think most pe even people who don't believe that babies in the womb are babies, I think part of their grief is that they feel it in their soul that they are, and and they they struggle to process that and. I found anyone who treated my baby like it was a baby uh, just made the world of difference. So um, I had some friends who sent flowers. Um, I had a friend who sent me a Mother's Day card the Mother's Day after I had my miscarriage, uh, just wanting to, you know, remind me that I was a mum and that you know, and similarly, my sister-in-law sent a card a year after we lost the baby saying that, you know, I still, you know, feel sad about my nephew and niece and miss them. And, you know, it's, it's those kind of things that just make such a difference to, to feel like that, yeah, other people were there and cared and shared the pain. Um, and I think it's that whole thing of just not playing playing it down. I remember having a conversation with someone who was like, oh, I had a miscarriage once and now I don't even think about it. And that wasn't what I, I didn't want to hear that. Like, I, I, I 
in my grief, I just wanted someone to understand and sit with me in my pain. So I think those are some things that I found really helpful when um, struggling with my miscarriage. I find that goes with people uh, who's going through IVF as well. Yeah. Because uh, you have your embryo transfer, which is failed. You can't see it, you know, unless you look under microscope. But that's an intangible loss, and it's a potential life as well. And I remember we had this phone call. We were at church then, and and, and they rang up from the hospital saying, "Okay, don't bother coming because uh, the, the embryo just basically died. So it's no point going to the hospital for embryo transfer." And I remember uh, someone from the office, uh, yeah, she was so sympathetic and she treated it like a, a, a normal miscarriage uh, because it, it is a potential life. You know, just to bear in mind that even though you can't see it, you know, for someone going to IVF, that's also like a miscarriage basically, uh, except that, you know, it could be in a test tube or it could be, you know, something that you can't see, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <clears throat> All right, thanks for those answers. Um, what are the ways that we can be spiritual parents to those around us? I think it's just being involved in families' lives. Like I know um, I had a couple of nieces and in a sense um, I was their spiritual um, godmother or whatever, um, just because they used to stay with me for holidays a lot of the time. And and I know I was talking to one of my other single friends and she she's just a special person in not just her nieces and nephews' lives, but also in some other friends of hers in their kids' lives and has been able to sort of nurture that spiritual side of them just because she's had the time and attention to spend with them and yeah I think it's just nurturing relationships with kids whether they're your own or in someone else's family and I know um, because I've had so many different housemates over the years many of them have actually um, been adult orphans and just been really struggling with finding their way and so it's been quite lovely to have them you know share my house for however long and um, once again just to listen to them and and share my faith when it was you know appropriate or whatever I think it's again keeping your eyes open and ears open and just asking God to show you the opportunities I think not just uh, individuals uh, older married couples can be mentoring younger couples you know uh, who have a lot of uh, a life experience and a longer time walking with Jesus, they're able to just get alongside the, the, the younger ones. Um, there's so many, yeah, so many ways. It's a great question, so many ways. Just just role modeling your, 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 your faith, your walk with Jesus. And, um, and I've got, I think two or three mentors already, whatever, and they've been there with, uh, with me and then I mentor other people and then peer mentor. So yeah, just as you said, relationships, but also within groups, uh, life groups, and also other married couples. Um, really important to have that. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think um, we sometimes focus, we, we tend to kind of think about being spiritual parents to people, but I've also seen the role that spiritual, almost grandparents can play. Uh, because for a lot of people, uh, their parents aren't around when they have kids. And so um, having someone around who's a little bit older who can help, who can assist, that can be a really powerful thing. My, uh, my parents run uh, uh, the creche at their church and they have been to so many grandparents' days um, at their local kinders where they've been able to go with the kids from their creche and be the grandparent for the day. And that's just a real, that, that's another, you know, beautiful relationship that we can have, um, yeah, spiritual grandparents and parents to those around us. Great. Thanks for those answers, guys. Um, so the next question is actually directed to you, Anne. It says, Anne, how can uh, we best tune in to the pain of single people longing to be parents without being intrusive or making assumptions? 
what have you found helpful or unhelpful? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, I know that at one stage, one of my sisters, she and her husband were going over with their two girls um, to Kiribati, and so remote place, and they actually asked me to be um, that my name could be put on their will in case anything happened to what happened to them as a guardian. And I was quite shocked because I was quite physically um, incapacitated at the time. But I think just having that trust element meant so much to me. And I think, um, yeah, all the, all the, I just have to check that I'm actually answering the question properly, but, but I think, um, you know, when, when other people will trust you, with their kids that yeah that that has meant a lot I think it's uh you know as Belinda was saying including you know just being inclusive and another one of my sisters I know like I actually spent time well Janet Janet and Sam some of you will know um I spent quite a bit of time with them in Pakistan and they just opened up their family situation to me so I was home you know I was helping Janet with the schooling and you know, it, like even that sort of thing, just just feeling a part of that. And and yes, yeah. I think um, it's listening. There were there were like I still have moments of feeling I've missed out or feel left out. Um, but that's just part of this process of learning to be content too. And I think yeah, that in, that inclusiveness and um, and sharing and also. With, with people, as I said, this other, this just this trust element. I trust you with my kids kind of thing. And I'm thinking, wow, and here I am, you know, hardly able to look after myself at that particular point in time. Um, yeah, does that answer it? <laughs> just having a look at. Yeah, no, that was, that was really good. That was great. Thanks, Sam. Okay, next question. And I think this will be the final question, maybe. Um, how do I know the difference between a good, healthy desire for kids and whether I'm making it an idol? Would there be any helpful ways to bring this up with someone who is struggling in this area? It's, uh, it's interesting. I think there are some questions you can ask yourself to kind of almost like diagnose what your idols are. Um, I remember actually going, to, when I was struggling with infertility, going to a seminar on the topic of idolatry and we had a series of questions to ask. And one of the questions was, is there anything that if you, God didn't give it to you that you would turn away from him? And that's a really like, or is there anything that if it happened, it would make you turn away from God? And um, and that was really challenging for me to kind of think to myself, wow, like where does infertility sit? If God doesn't give me kids, how will that change how I feel about him? Um, and so I think asking yourself those kind of questions um, is really helpful to try to work out if this thing is an idol. And I think... Um, parenthood can be a really big idol, I think, both for people with and without kids. Um, and so, yeah, checking your heart, reminding yourself. And I think as well the, um, the ethical questions are also a helpful way, like am I willing to compromise what I believe to get what I want? If I am, well, then maybe that's an idol and I need to repent and think about that. As, as well as those things, um, think about how often you dwell and are consume, consumed by it. Uh, that's usually a good indication it's an idol. <laughs> um, and I like that one about compromising uh, your, your faith. That's that's important. Yeah. Yeah. I find it's helpful, you know, if you're in that state, you know, referral to a counsellor might help because beneath that is loss and grief, is um, grieving over the loss of a potential child one that's in your likeness, uh, you know, the, the loss of, you know, the, the dreams and hopes you have in this potential child. 
So I think it's a process that needs to be worked out with a, a council that, that mm. might help. Yeah. Can, yeah, can I lay this down? Uh, and you got to ask a question. Say if I'm, I don't have children. We had to ask that question too, going through IVF. Go through. Say, if, can we still follow Jesus and, and be happy? Mm. And yes, there's still that grief and everything. I'm not push, pushing that aside, but can we still move forward? Can we lay this down? Uh, and sometimes when we lay things down, God does give us those things back. Other times he doesn't give us those things back. So it's really, again, it's that surrendering, isn't it? <laughs> it's that moment by moment, take up a cross daily and follow Jesus. Mm. Um, it's, it's not, sounds very easy. I'll say it with in that little sentence or little phrase, but uh, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, but that is our discipleship. Um, it's a laying down, mm. allowing Jesus to be Lord uh, and to be King. Um, in whatever area and it's a hard hard call that's what we've been asked to do it can sound very glib to say to seek first the kingdom of god and all these things will be added to you but it's but i think all the time we've got to think where where actually is our focus is it on is it on jesus we just got to keep looking to jesus and sometimes that's you know you sort of think oh it sounds yeah it sounds easy but um yeah. look to where your focus is yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, this will be the last question. Um, as a young person, I was like, oh, this is a good question. Not that if anyone doesn't know, this is my mum. <laughs> and not directly because of her, but just generally as a young person who is recently married but doesn't have any kids yet. Uh, parents of married couples sometimes long to have grandchildren and can place pressure on their children to give them grandchildren. What are some helpful ways that grandparents can deal with their own longings to be a grandparent? I think that it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a, it is a similar grief, I think, for people, like, to have this dream of being grandparents and maybe know that that's not possible. Um, when we were trying to have kids, um, my younger sister at the time was single and it really felt like part of the grief of infertility was knowing that my parents, who just adore babies and kids, that maybe they would be missing out. And I remember talking to my mum about it and her saying to me that, you know, that they loved me and that the thing that they really cared about was me and you know, me having the opportunity to have kids and that they didn't want me to worry about them missing out uh, because I was what mattered. And that was so lovely to hear. And it was just, it, it took a weight off my heart when dealing with these kind of issues. So I think it's hard because I think it's hard when it, it's, it's extra tricky when there's infertility involved. And I think it's about being sensitive to your kids and loving them through that. Um, I don't think anyone enjoys being pressured to have kids. So probably don't. <laughs> Is that my to say that? Yeah, I think, I think trying to love and care for your kids as best you can in those circumstances and know that the grief that they're potentially going through is, is really big and they need support and love through it. Just send them off to bingo. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks for, um, yeah, thanks for answering all those questions uh, to all the panelists and Belinda. Um, and sorry um, to those we couldn't get to your questions. There were quite a few, but um, I hope those questions answered were really helpful and insightful. Um, definitely were for me. Um, and thanks, Belinda, for sharing your message as well. Um, it was really fun, uh, wonderful to hear. And yeah, to the panelists sharing today, that was really great. Thank you so much for that, guys. And for those of you at home, we'd really love to hear what you thought of today's event and any suggestions you have for future events. Um, there's a QR code there that you can post um, 
on there and also there's the link to the chat. Yeah, there'll be a link in the chat yeah. for the feedback form um, for you to give your feedback for us. Um, for the women who have joined us today, our next gathering will be um, the Belgrave Heights Women's Convention on Saturday the 9th of October. Um, so if you'd like, please mark that in your diaries. Um, that'll come up on the screen as well. And that's all from us today. If you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to chat with Nat or Sandra or email women at crossculture.net.au. Thanks, everybody. And <laughs> yeah, and sorry, Gail will just close in prayer for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for Belinda sharing her story and um, Greg and Kumchi and Anne and their answers to a lot of our questions and um, thank you for their wisdom in their journey. And um, we just do pray that we will be refreshed and inspired and that we will remember that our identity is in God, in Christ, and God loves all of us and wants to bless mm -hmm and use us for all of us for his glory. In your name, Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thank yeah, you thanks very much. Everybody. Thanks, Linda and, and oh, Greg. Thanks.